I enjoyed that. Uh, uh, always nice um, when we get uh, those that have the skills and the ability to sing and uh, play specials to, to do those things. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I know that they weren't quite sure how it was all going to turn out, but <laughs> I have to say it was... Uh, it was marvelous, but uh, even as they were, uh, Dick and I were sitting back there yesterday, and uh, even when they would stop and they would talk, and they said that they were off and they needed to put things on, Dick and I were like, "Sounded good to me. <laughs> it sounded uh, sounded like it was it was good to me, uh, but it sounded great. I hope everybody appreciated it this morning." Um, We began our last Sunday uh, looking at the last week of our Lord, or Passion Week, what a lot of people call it, and we've kind of moved through. I'll review a little bit throughout the week, things that are covered, bring us up to uh, Friday, and that's what we're going to look at this morning, and then we're going to look at tonight, uh, Saturday, and Sunday. Kind of a little, little out of order, most people have a message right for Sunday morning about the resurrection, but that portion of it is going to actually be this evening. So come back uh, for that part, the uh, finale of our uh, Easter Sunday uh, together. Uh, well, we began the last Sunday looking at uh, Sunday. Uh, some people will call it Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry, that time when our Lord rode on the donkey into Jerusalem. And uh, there were some things that... I, I gave us to remember. I, I kept giving us things to remember throughout the week. And I hope you remember with that. I'm going to say it a lot, so remember. Uh, that uh, the Lord prepared the events that were going to happen, didn't He? He made the preparations. And as we look at reaching our Jerusalem, our Lord has made preparations right here for you. And for me, with those people that we are uh, to reach out to. And as he comes in, I, the second thing I said for you to remember was the... Anybody remember? The donkey. To remember the donkey. And with the donkey, that, that represented peace, boldness, and humility as we reach people in our Jerusalem. And then I give you another thing from that morning to remember the... Gate. Remember the gate that normally Jesus would come in through the sheep gate where he could come in without being noticed, but this time he came in being noticed. Remember the gate. And that was just that oftentimes we want to hide the Lord and he wants us to put him up and bring him in the main entrance into Jerusalem. And then we had our, we looked, that was Sunday. Then we went on Sunday evening last week. We looked at actually Monday, the Monday of the Lord's last week, where he actually uh, went in and cleansed the temple, and he also cursed the fig tree. And I said, remember the temple. And then remember the fruit. Remember the fruit. Exactly right. And then... If you guys weren't here on Wednesday, on our Wednesday night service, we looked at Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And on Tuesday, the Lord uh, had his confrontation with a group of Pharisees. And that's where he pronounces some woes on them. And also there's some Greeks that are there, and they want to see Jesus. They're kind of seeking the Lord. And we end that Tuesday. Lord sharing uh, his sermon up on the, uh, I guess the discourse is what it would be, not the Sermon on the Mount, but the Olivet Discourse, that takes us to chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew, where he speaks of things that are going to happen kind of in the end. That was uh, Tuesday. And then we looked at Wednesday. Who remembers what happened on Wednesday? Prayer, or it was a day of silence. So we said, 
Well, may, very likely, maybe they were praying like we were doing here. It was a time of prayer for them, but it was a day actually of silence where we don't have a lot of history recorded. Actually, the events that were happening on Wednesday of that last week, Lord, and that takes us to Thursday. And on Thursday, what we looked at was, uh, that was uh, the preparation of the Passover. And there's some people that call Thursday something, and I couldn't remember for sure what the name of it was, but I mentioned it, and I don't know if it was right. Uh, but people celebrate that uh, Passover times on that Thursday of the Passion Week. And, uh, and it also, not only did they celebrate the Passover, but Jesus puts aside the Passover institutes the Lord's Supper. That's the upper room discourses that he gives of John 13 and 14 where he washes their feet. He also talks about uh, the vine and the branches. And as we get to John 17, who re- I know Brother Kurt remembered what John 17 spoke about. Does anybody else remember what John 17 speaks about? Jesus' high priestly prayer. His high priestly prayer. Prayer, and then they go out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where we focused our Wednesday night was on uh, the Lord's last. It would be His last miracle or His pre last pre Calvary miracle that He does. And He actually it was when the Peter takes the sword and he t- takes off Malchus's ear, his right ear, and the Lord heals. Him. But some of the illustration that we looked there was Peter took up the sword and he was, gonna, he was taking a carnal weapon to fight a spiritual. So I told the people, and I hope they remembered that on Wednesday, on our Wednesday service, that to remember it's a spiritual battle, not a carnal battle. That takes us here to Friday. Friday of our Lord's last week. And I'm going to read from uh, Luke chapter uh, 23. Look at some of the events here, and then we're going to focus on uh, some of the things that we focused on on Monday study at the manor with some of the men there. We're going to look at some of the things from that. But uh, Luke uh, chapter 23, we'll begin reading in verse 26. If you want to follow along, and we'll come back and look at a few things here for this Sunday morning. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in that in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, There they crucified him and the malefactors, the one on the right and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. 
And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Right prior to the events that we read right here where the Lord goes out with His cross and Simon the Cyrenian carries that for Him. Jesus goes into the court after Gethsemane and He's taken before the chief priests, the elders, and the Sanhedrin. And they ship Him over to a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. And as the Lord comes before Pontius Pilate, we know that Pontius Pilate brings Him out. And He offers to chastise Him and I'll release Him. I'll chastise Him and release Him. And He tells the crowd of people, He says, I find no fault in Him. He's done nothing amiss to deserve crucifixion. He's done nothing wrong. And then you know, brings out, if you will, a couple. Jesus and a man by the name of Barabbas. We know that Barabbas was a man that had been guilty of insurrection within the city. Also, he was a robber and he was a murderer. And he says, Pilate says, who shall I release to you? Jesus, the king of the Jews, or Barabbas? The one that's been accused of the insurrection, right? And wouldn't you know, the crowd says, Release unto us Barabbas, but take Jesus and crucify. crucify him. Then what does Pilate do? But he washes his hands, doesn't he? I wonder if that did him any good. I don't think so. He washes his hands and he says, you know, his blood not be upon me, but it be upon you. Not me, I washed myself from it. You're the ones that have said that he needs to be crucified. Remember, I found no fault in him. But you know, he fell prey to what the mob wanted. And he gave them exactly what they asked for. And that was Jesus. And Jesus goes from Pilate to the Praetorium. And the Praetorium was actually a place, if you don't know, it's a headquarters for the Roman military. The governor of the military and his soldiers, they were an elite group. Of soldiers. You know, they became so elite and so powerful that they later on threatened the Caesar of Rome because of their great power. That's where our Lord is turned over to them. And some of the passages that we read, if you balance it together, it looks like they they go out to the praetorium a little bit and they 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 put him in a robe, right? A purple robe. They put a cloak on him, put a crown of thorns on him. And it looks like maybe in one of those accounts, he actually comes back to Pilate for a minute and he puts him before him and says, you know, here's your king, the king of the Jews. And another time when Pilate brings him out, he says, behold the, anybody remember what the the man? One time it's behold the man, the other time it's, you know, the king of the Jews. But we know these are the Roman soldiers that actually brought a great beating upon the Lord. And I would say that some suggest the Lord was beaten beyond recognition. The many wouldn't recognize what He looked like. But here these soldiers put this robe on Him, the crown on Him, they spit on Him, they strike His head and they mock Him. You know? And then they put Him back In his own clothes, they give him the cross. And he heads to Calvary. To Calvary. I think of the song that Carol sang and that Kelly did. The day he wore my crown. And thinking, I'm thinking of the crown of thorns. The day he wore my crown. The crown that I should have had. And here our Lord goes to the cross, Calvary, where He's going to be crucified. The thing that I want to look at as we begin to look out into our Jerusalem is there's some things I think that we can pick up here to remember too. There's lots of things that, that I've said over the last week to remember. I hope you can remember them. I don't know if you will or not, but 
Hopefully the Lord will bring them to your mind at some point in time. But do you notice in verse 34 what the Lord says? He says, then, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lot. It's not only speaking of the two malefactors, but the soldiers, all those people that were there. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Remember, it was the day he wore your crown. So he's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That means each one of us had a part in putting and nailing Jesus Christ to that cross. You can try and deny it. And you can try and say it's not your fault. But because of your sin, you nailed Him to the cross. And the Lord says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I can't help but to think that as we're reaching our Jerusalem, you know salvation is for every person. Salvation is for every woman and child and man out here, isn't it? It's for all. It's not for an elect few, but it's for everyone in our Jerusalem. Salvation is for all. I think that's what we see when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. But I want us to take a look at the three people that we see. We see three people on crosses. Don't we? Can you picture? There's, there's pictures and there's, there's things out there about the three crosses. It seems like when I think of them in my mind, the middle one is a little bit higher than the other two. Can you see that picture in my mind? That's how I always see it. I don't know if that's true or not, but the pictures that we see, the one in the middle is a little higher than the ones on the side. And I think probably that was so to make it specific to the Lord to look to His cross and what he was doing. But there's three people here. Three people. And as we go into our Jerusalem, we need to carry with us and know that there's three people. The first one I want to look at was the one that was on the cross dying for the sins of the world. There was one there dying for the sins of the world or dying for sin. And we know that's Jesus, isn't it? He was dying for sin. He had prepared himself for this offering in this place. Remember, we learned the Sunday before that he'd made the preparations. He made the preparation for that cross for himself to be on it. He made the preparations for it. And I appreciate what Brother Kurt said uh, last Sunday evening that the Lord rode in Jerusalem being our Redeemer. Our Redeemer rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. Our Redeemer to bring peace and to bring humility. Boldness. You see the Lord this time, you remember, He didn't go through the sheep gate, but He came through the main entrance. He wasn't going to be... You know, I think the more I think about it, the more specific, why didn't He go into the sheep gate? Because through the sheep gate was the place where they took the sacrifices. And he was the Passover lamb, wasn't he? Well, you see, the Bible says that he was going to be crucified outside the camp. Outside the camp. So he comes the main entrance. And he suffers greatly, doesn't he? At the hands of the Romans, the hands of the Jews. But I want you to see again this morning at your... And you had the hammer in your hands. And you nailed it there. So we got the one in the middle dying for sin. Your sin and my sin. And then we have another man here. This one is, I want you to catch the phrases, one dying for sin. This one happened to be dying from sin. This man on the cross was dying from sin who happens to be the repentant thief. You see, he understood many things in life, didn't he? He did. And I want to look at some of those things that this repentant thief 
was able to understand in the last hours of his life. He never recognized it before, but now he recognizes it. And what does he see? The first thing he sees, he repents. He sees it himself. He's a sinner. 41 says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Jesus, he's in the middle of us. He's done nothing amiss. He's done nothing to deserve to be crucified. But I have. You see, he could see himself as a sinner. And look, if you look at that verse right before it, verse 40 says, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? This is the same thing. Same one that we see in verse 41, the same man talking. The one that says that we've done nothing amiss. But the other one was railing on him, wasn't he? The other one was railing on him, and this one comes and rebukes the other guy and says, don't you see that, you know, now we're in the same condemnation. I love that word, condemnation. Because he recognized that they were condemned. And they were condemned to one place, and that was hell. He could see it right there. We are condemned. You see, he first saw himself. He saw that he was a sinner. That he had done wrong, but Jesus had done nothing wrong. And that his punishment was going to be hell. Condemnation. Condemnation. So he repents. He rebukes the other thief. But in that rebuke, we see that he's able to see that he's condemned to hell. But then what does he do? What does this thief do? Or the malefactor we call him? Verse 42 it says, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I'm picturing this. I'm picturing the three of them on crosses. The Lord in the middle, one on the right, one on the left, and I still don't know for sure which one was on the right and which one was on the left. Does anybody else know? I can't find for sure a passage in the scripture that says which one's on the right, which on the left. I want to say the repentant thief was on the right and the other thief was on the left because isn't that what the Lord does when he comes at his second coming? Aren't those that are on his right go with him and those that are on his left depart? So I'm just thinking in my mind it could follow through with that, but I, I don't know for sure. But one's on the right and one's on the left. And Jesus is in the middle. And this thief says unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. I don't think this thief was looking forward when he said this. On the cross, nailed to, hooked to the cross, just like the Lord was, I think he was in eye contact with the Lord Jesus Christ eyes was looking upon the Lord. And I don't know, I'm thinking the Lord's eyes were spoiled up because he'd been beaten. But enough that he could still look and see the thief on the cross next to him. You notice what he does? Not only does he understand that he's a sinner, he understands the penalty of his sin is condemnation separation from God. But then he looks upon the one that can save him. And that was Jesus in the middle. And he looks at him and he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. Remember me, Lord. I understand I'm a sinner. I understand I'm condemned to hell. But you know what I see right now? Lord, I see this is the day you wore my crown. Isn't it? I believe the Lord still had the crown on. And all the pictures that you see, it looks like he still had the crown. I believe he still was carrying that crown on his head at that time. And the thief could see it was the day that Jesus wore his crown. He was taking his place, suffering for him, the thief that deserved it. He deserved it. But Jesus had done nothing 
amiss. Hey, I appreciate what the Lord says back. Verse 43 says, And Jesus said unto him, Verily, I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Today you shall be with me in paradise. Right, today. You see, when we recognize that we're sinners and we understand the consequence to our sin, the only thing that can help us is Jesus Christ. That's what this thief found. And when we look to Jesus Christ, what he does back? He looks to you. He can see you. He can see me. He looks back and I, you know, I'm just seeing, he, he's looking at the thief with swelled up eyes, with a beaten body, bruised, beyond recognition. But he looks back at that thief and says, today, today, that doesn't mean tomorrow, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know there's another thief on this cross? I think he's on the left. I think he's on the left just following other scriptures out. I can't say that for sure, but I think he's on the left. And what does that thief on the left say? He says, and one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Christ came to save sinners. Who that thief was a sinner. But he wants to save yourself and save us. Right? I think he was, I, I think he, he pulled right into what Peter did when, when Peter in the, in the garden there took the sword and took Malchus' right ear off. I think the thief right here on the cross, this thief is picking, a, he's using a carnal method for a spiritual battle. And the spiritual battle is over his soul. And he's going to pick up a carnal method. Lord, you just, you just come off that cross and if you come off there, maybe you can take us too. Save us. Save us from dying on this cross. But he never did see that he had done anything wrong. You never see that. We see that with the other thief. He's the one he understood the condition that he was in. And he put his faith and trust in the Lord. You see, in our Jerusalem, we need to remember there's three people. We need to be lifting up the one that was dying for sin. And we can say in our day and time, the one that has died for sin. But there are, there are only two other groups of people in our community. Those that are dying from sin. In that last thief, you know what he was dying? He was dying in his sin. He was dying in his sin. See, there are people in this community dying in their sin. Not dying from sin. See, the one dying from sin was because he was dying because that's what sin's going to cause in your life, a physical death. But you see, the one that was dying in his sin was not only going to face a physical death, but there would be a spiritual death in hell. We need to remember the one that was on the cross. The one, I, I love the song that they sang this morning. He wore my crown. Elevate the one in our community that wore our crown. And there's two groups here. I hope we're on the group of the repentant thief and we've come to relationship with the Lord. And you know what we got to do? We got to reach the whole other group, the ones that are dying in their sins. You know, I think it's just a pretty simple 
pretty simple gospel message that we see right here. It's pretty simple gospel message that we see with the thieves on the cross. One of them came to life in Christ. One of them was condemned to hell because he refused to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven and hell are real. And the Lord wants to take us to heaven. But there's only one way. And we have to know what the thief did. The thief that recognized that he was a sinner. He looked upon Jesus that wore his crown. That's the only way to be saved. It's the only way to heaven. People in John 10 talks about the other people that try and come up by some other way. There's only one way. Jesus is the way. He's the truth in his life. No man cometh unto the Father but through me. That's the only way. That's what we have to reach our community with. It's a simple message of the gospel. But the people would come to the Lord. And that's the message this morning. I ask you this. Who are you? I know that you're not Jesus. Are you this morning the repentant thief truly? Or are you the thief that has not repented of his sin and is on his way to hell? You see, you know the devil wants to convince you? He wants to convince you that you've truly turned to him and maybe you haven't. If you haven't, what a great Easter Sunday morning to come to Jesus Christ for the first time and to look upon Him as your Savior. I want to give you the opportunity to do that here in just a minute. This, after these, the thieves that are here, And I want to read that last little part. I'm going to give opportunity for you guys to consider your hearts. Verse 44, where it says, It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Thine hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, He gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance, women that followed him from Galilee, stood afar off, beholding these things. See, that's what our community is doing this Sunday. They are really beholding all these things of this week, aren't they? In a lot of places, beholding these things. And behold... There was a man named Joseph, a counselor. He was a good man and just. The same had consented to the counsel and, deed and, and the deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and he took it down and he wrapped it in linen and in a sepulcher that was hewn in a stone, wherein never man before was laid. And that day was a preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after, and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid. And they returned, and prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So the Lord dies there, doesn't he? He commends his spirit into the Father's hands. Father, you do with it what you have to do, Right? You do with it what you have to do for the people of the world. And he's buried physically in a tomb that no man had ever laid in. Some people say it was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Don't know that for sure, very likely. But no man had been laid there. You see, I asked you a few minutes ago which person you are. The repentant thief? You see, if we look at the thief again that, was, that died and that had repented... You know, it's who died first on these three crosses? Who was the first one? Jesus was, right? When they came along, what did they do with the other two? They broke their limbs. They weren't dead yet, right? If they broke their limbs, it would make them die quicker. 
But when they came to the Lord, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't have to break any of his limbs, fulfilling what the Scripture says, that not a bone would be broken, right? Not a bone would be broken. But the other ones die after. You know, I can't help but think a little bit more of that one that repented. You see, it's never too late. There are deathbed conversions. People can come to Christ the very last hour, the very last minute of their life. That's what this thief speaks about. It's never too late to come to Jesus. It isn't. It's never too late. But He's always got the provision for you. Here He comes. You know, it dispels a lot of false doctrine that's out there. Some people talk about sac- sacramentalism, that you've got to be confirmed to be saved. Some people believe that you've got to be sprinkled as a baby to be saved. Some people th- say that you've got to take Holy Communion to be saved. I don't call it Holy Communion, it's Communion. Holy, not Holy Communion, but Communion. Holy Communion is something that uh, Catholicism has taken on. It's a term that they use, Holy Communion. Church membership doesn't save you. Coming to church doesn't save you. Personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Or how about uh, the doctrine of baptismal regeneration? Baptism saves you. Baptism does not save us. Otherwise, the thief on the cross would have died in his sins. Wouldn't he have? He didn't have to be baptized. He believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It also refutes the doctrine of purgatory. Right? You have an opportunity right there to believe or not to believe. One thief believed, the other one didn't believe. It also takes away the doctrine of universalism. All people are saved. Not all people are saved. Only those that place their trust in Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you an opportunity... If you're without the Lord here and you truly haven't repented of your sin like the thief on the cross did, the repentant thief, he wants you to come and look upon him today and to be thinking about the song that Carol sang, that Kelly played, and remember it was the day he wore your crown. Jesus wore your crown. He died for you. If you take it, A moment and and bow your heads with me. And I just want to give an invitation if there's anyone here that hasn't come to the Lord. We want to give you opportunity to respond to Him. If that's you and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Don't be afraid to raise your hand. But raise your hand. If that's you, I'm going to lead you along to the most important decision that you can ever make for your life. And that's to come to belief in Jesus Christ. It's pretty simple, just like we saw here. What you have to believe in your heart is that you are a sinner, just like this thief. And you have to believe that that sin condemns you to hell, like he was able to see. But in your sin and being condemned to hell, that repentant thief looked to the Lord and Savior of his life, Jesus Christ, who was wearing the thorn-crowned brow. And he saw Him as his Savior. He looked upon Him and trusted Him and believed by faith in who He was. Jesus calls you to that same place here this morning to believe in Him that He's the one that came from glory, fully God and fully man, and died in your place to free you from condemnation, to put you in the area where this thief was in paradise, in heaven forever. If that's you, you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, and you believe that in your heart, and that's the first time that you've been able to see Jesus, as your Savior, the one that wore your crown. 
If you believe that and you invite Jesus into your life, into your heart, He tells us in the Word that He saves you and you're on the pathway to heaven. It's pretty simple. And if that's you, I thank the Lord if you just invited Him in to your life to be your Savior. Now, there's changes that He's going to make in your life and He's putting you on a new road. And it's a great road. I know we got a brother in this room right here that just come to that road just recently. Carl did. Oh, what a great day that was. And he'll speak of it when he came to know you, Jesus, as his Savior. We thank you, Lord, for salvation. And Lord, as, as we end our service here, Father, we just pray for those in our community, those here, Lord, that are dying in their sin. Help us to remember, Lord, them, that there's folks here in that condition. Help us to reach them with the gospel message of truth that they can be set free and they can see you, Lord. I ask that you bless the remainder of this day, Lord, this Easter Sunday, the day that we're reminded of your resurrection. And Lord, bring us back here tonight where we're going to look at... Uh, Saturday, the events that happened actually later on on Friday and Saturday and on into Sunday morning. Oh, there's some great truth, Lord, that you want us to be able to see. Carry us there tonight. Bring us back here, Lord, together to be able to worship you. To end our day, Lord, continuing to praise you as being our great Redeemer, our great living, risen Savior, Lord, I thank you so much for it. And I, I want to just throw my arms up just like Harlan did when he was praising you, when we were singing hymns together. Lord, he was loving you and praising you for being his risen Savior. Thank you for that. Bless our times, Lord, as we gather with families this afternoon. Lord, that we can have a great day in you. In Jesus' name, amen.